this video I'm going to be talking about statistical power and how we can calculate statistical power using software such as GPower. I'm going to start off by explaining some conceptual tidbits about statistical power. If you want to skip that part and get straight to the example of how to calculate power and GPower, then just skip this section. So what is statistical power? Power is related to type 2 error, the lesser known of the type errors. And type 2 error is concerned with the equally serious problem of not finding a difference that actually exists. This is opposed to a type 1 error where you find a difference that doesn't actually exist. So statistical power is inversely related to beta, or the probability of making a type 2 error. So in short, power equals 1 minus beta, or the probability of making a type 2 error. There's two types of power calculations that one can do. Firstly, there's an a priori power calculation. And in an a priori calculation, you basically want to find out the required sample size you need to get an adequate statistical power for your test. So a priori is done before your actual data collection process and initial analysis. And this is opposed to a post hoc calculation, which is determining the power of your study based on the data that you have already collected. So for example, if I've collected 50 participants and I've already calculated the effect size of the difference between that exists within these, the sample size, then I can determine the power of my sample, whether it's whether there's a high chance of a type 2 error or a low chance of a type 2 error. There are many ways to manually calculate power, such as those given in Howell's textbook, but in my opinion it is easier to use GPower, mainly because it saves you time and you know that there won't be any errors made in your calculations. So just to discuss a few factors that influence statistical power, firstly it's the alpha level that you set. So having a, a smaller alpha level such as 0 0.01 as opposed to 0 0.05 will increase the chances of you making a type 2 error. Secondly, the magnitude of the effect size. The higher the effect size, the larger that the difference will be and therefore the higher the power will be when you have that large effect size. And Similarly, the higher the sample size used, the greater the power will be. For a priori research, Howell suggests two methods of finding the effect size or determining the effect size. Firstly, you can look at previous um, papers and journals, as researchers are currently being encouraged to report the effect size calculations along with the p scores. And secondly, and secondly, you can do a personal assessment of how large a difference is important based on the specific study that you're doing. Okay, so now that we got that conceptual stuff out the way, let's just go on to the calculations. Alright, so I'm going to be using GPower version 3.1.9.2 and I'll link the, the URL for this program in the description. So basically, to start off with, you can see here the, the tests family. So you have the exact tests, such as Fisher's Z test, the F test, such as your ANOVA families, T tests, such as um, independent and dependent samples, chi square tests, as well as Z tests. For this example, I'm just going to be focusing mainly on T tests and going to be focusing particularly on the statistical tests of correlations difference between matched pairs and difference between independent pairs for t-tests. And I think those are mainly the, the primary tests used. Okay, and then here the type of analysis we can see along with other options such as sensitivity analysis and criterion analysis. We have a priori which computes the required sample size based on the power that you want to achieve and the effect size that you're using as well as post hoc. So this computes the achieved power of the sample that you have already collected. So let's start off with uh, an independent sample t-test. 
So the parameters that you need to focus on are the tail, so this is a, a two-tailed or a one-tailed test. If you have a one-tailed test, the power will likely increase if you have the same amount of sample size and effect size as a two-tailed test. This is because you're really only looking at one direction of difference. So all of the power will be focused on one or one side of the normal distribution, basically. However, people generally do use two-tailed tests as opposed to one-tailed tests, so we're going to stick with that. So for effect size, this is Cohen's D, which is the <coughs> which is the primary measure of effect size used for t-tests, although there are others, but in this case we'll just be using Cohen's D. And for Cohen's D, if you want to know more about effect sizes, then watch my effect size series videos. But a 0 0.2 Cohen's D can be interpreted as a small effect size, uh, and it pops up and tells you. 0 0.5 is a medium, and 0 0.8 can be considered a large effect size. So we're going to start off with a small effect size and then work our way up just to show how differences in power can be calculated. And then our alpha size, alpha level, 0 0.05, which is quite default, can generally be changed to 0 0.01 as well, but we're going to leave it at 0 0.05 for now. And power. So this is the power that you want to achieve. Generally, as long as it's above 0 0.9, your power is good enough. So we can make it 0 0.9 as opposed to 0 0.95. And your allocation ratio is number of samples or number of participants in interview groups. So if you have equal sample sizes or equal group sizes, then the allocation ratio would be 1. If you have twice as many participants as in one group compared to another, then your allocation ratio would be 2. So we're just going to leave it at 1 for this. And using all of these parameters, we can then calculate what our expected sample size would be under a power of 0 0.9. So, so once we've calculated, we can see the output here. And we can see that in order to get a power of 0 0.9, using an effect size of 0 0.2, and an alpha level of 0 0.05 with an equal allocation between groups, we would need a total sample size of 1,054, which is a, a very large sample size most of the time. However, as you can see, if we change it to a one tail, our sample size would already decrease substantially. As we increase the effect size, let's make it a medium effect size now, our sample size decreases almost by tenfold. So we would have we would have a required sample size of one hundred and seventy two as opposed to one thousand and fifty four if we can increase the effect size from a small effect size to a medium effect size. Now if we were to have a large effect size, that the sample size becomes much more manageable at a total sample size required of sixty four. And again, if we make it a one-tailed test, it becomes 56 at a, a large effect size. Now, as your power prediction or your, the power you want to achieve decreases, the total sample size would needed would decrease as well. Okay, so if we wanted to do a, a similar a priori test with a dependent measures, it's pretty much the same parameters as opposed for the the allocation or the proportion allocation of the samples because you would have to have matched samples, obviously matched data. So now Cohen's DZ, which is a slightly different calculation, you can check that the you can check out the, the first effect size video for an explanation of what Cohen's DZ entails and how to calculate it. If we wanted to have a power of 0 0.90 0 again we would need a sample size of 44. But note that for, as we're using a dependent means or a matched pairs design, 
we would need 44 participants in each match pair. So in total, if you're having two different groups or not using the same participant twice, you would need double the sample size. But because in match data, it's, it counts number of matched pairs, not number of individual items, that's why it says you would need a sample size of 44. Just take a note of that. And lastly, for correlation, you would firstly need to determine your FX size for the correlation, and that can really be, you just click on determine, and the coefficient of determination for a correlation test would be your R value, or if you're doing multiple correlations, it would be your R squared value. So let's say we achieved a, a correlation value of so let's say we achieved a moderate correlation value of 0 0.5. This would then be transferred into an actual effect size, and then we can calculate and transfer to main window. Then once we have, let's make it power of 0.9 again, just to keep it consistent. And once we have our transformed effect size value, we can then calculate and determine that we need a total sample size of 13. If we had an initial R correlation value of 0.5 transformed into an effect size of 0.7 and an alpha level of 0.05 and a power of 0.9 as well as using a two-tailed design, that would be our required sample size. Okay, so now let's move on to post hoc. So this was a priori, which means that you're trying to determine the sample size that you would need given the amount of power that you want to achieve. So if we wanted to, if, let's say we've already collected our data and you want to determine the sample <coughs> or the power of our current sample, we would go to post hoc and we're going to start with correlations again. So let's say that we have a total sample size of let's say 10 and we have a, a correlation value of only 0 0.3 we calculate the transferred effect size and move it to the main window and we get an effect size of 0.54 we can then determine the overall power of our sample would be 0 0.44 or 0 0.45 so that would, that's quite a low power as it needs to be generally at the minimum above 0 0.8, preferably above 0 0.9. However, if we do increase our sample size, let's say 20, just by doubling our sample size, we've almost reached an acceptable level of power for our test at 0 0.79. So the same, the same principle works for the other tests. So let's go to two dependent means. So if we have a so if we have an effect size here, we can also determine exactly what DZ would be or how to interpret how to get DZ from the information that we have. Let's say we had a mean of five in one group and a mean of seven in the other group and standard deviation of 2.5 in group 1 and 3.5 in group 2 and let's say we have a correlation of 0.5 we can calculate dz as being 0 0.64 so we transfer that to the main window and let's say that we want to have a paired sample size of 20 so that's 20 in each group of paired data we would then calculate and discover that we have a power of 0.77 now if we were to change the alpha level to a, a lower level we can see that our power would decrease because the smaller the alpha level the less the power would be so it's it's okay to just keep it at 0 0.05 and lastly going to the two independent groups so let's say we have a Cohen's D, which you can also calculate here, and if you don't know it, so let's say we have a Cohen's D of 0. Point okay, it's about 0 0.8, a high level of difference in the measures, an alpha level of 0 0.05, a 
two-tailed, and let's say sample group one has 10 people, and sample group two has seven people. So it's not proportionate here. We can see that the overall power would be quite low. However, even, even though the effect size is quite large, the sample size is just not big enough in this case. However, if we were to increase it to 20 and 20, it increases substantially. If we were to increase Cohen's D to 1.5, which is possible, we will see that we have almost a perfect power level of 0 0.99. And that's pretty much it for this video. I hope it was useful in helping you to achieve in whatever you wanted to achieve by watching this video. If it was, give it a like and subscribe. If not, sorry.